With no heir in line to inherit the kingship, the throne was passed to Ai, Tutankhamun's closest advisor or vizier. Records show that right after he died, Ai prepared to marry Tutankhamun's young widow to help justify his assumption of the throne. There is evidence that she suspected Ai was responsible for her husband's death and tried to avoid this marriage. Desperate, the widow Ankes Enamun sought help from outside of Egypt. She turned to a land in the east controlled by the Hittites and wrote to their king. Send me one of your sons. You have many that I may marry one, and he shall become king, for I have none here whom I may marry. He did send one of his sons to be married to Ankes and Amun and become pharaoh of Egypt. But consider the bureaucrats. Horemheb was the general in charge of the army. I was the chief high priest. Curiously enough, the Hittite prince got as far as the borders of Egypt and he was murdered. I married Tutankhamun's widow in 1325 BC and became pharaoh before the deceased king's burial had been even completed. We know this from a painting in Tutankhamun's tomb. It depicts I already wearing a king's blue crown while he performs a ceremony during Tutankhamun's burial. Of course, it is possible that I was just the logical choice to assume the throne after young Tutankhamun died heirless. But there is one more suspicious aspect in the archaeological record from this time. Right after I ascends to the throne, there is no more mention of the young queen, Akasenamun. She disappears. Was she the next victim in this 3,000-year-old conspiracy? I reigned for only four years, and like Tutankhamun, had no heirs to carry on the 18th dynasty. Soon the throne of Egypt would belong to a new dynamic bloodline of kings. Among them would be the greatest of the pharaohs. He would usher in a period of building and expansion never to be equaled, and he would take the image of the pharaoh as a god to the extreme. The city of ancient Thebes. The pharaohs of Egypt were drawn to this landscape that lay along the banks of the Nile River. Queen Hatshepsut had embellished it with an obelisk that bore her name. Amenhotep III had built a grand temple to its patron god, Amun. Thebes' southern location was a natural choice for the capital city of a country that was expanding downward toward the rich territory of Nubia. The pharaoh Tutankhamun had moved the royal court back here before he died, and his vizier, Ai, had remained at Thebes during his brief reign. In 1321 BC, the general called Horemheb proclaimed himself to be the pharaoh of Upper and Lower Egypt. His name meant Horus in jubilation. Horus is Egypt's hawk-headed deity, a bird of prey, the god of the kings. Horemheb came to the throne after a long and distinguished military career which began four administrations earlier, when Amenhotep III was king. He was later appointed the great commander of the army by Akhenaten, and under King Tutankhamun, he was given the title of the king's deputy. Little is known about Horemheb's heritage. He was not from a royal bloodline and therefore had no claim to the throne. He remedied that by marrying Nefertiti's sister, thus creating a feeble link to the bloodline of the kings. Already middle-aged, Horemheb immediately set out to restore Egypt to its status prior to Akhenaten's heresy. 
At Thebes, he reopened the temples of Amun, but to avoid a power struggle with the priesthood, he appointed priests from the army. Since he was a military man, he felt they could be trusted. After this, Horam had initiated the destruction of the great temples to the sun disk built in Amarna by Akhenaten. He used the thousands of stone blocks he removed as filler inside the pylons and walls of his new building projects. But his efforts to erase all traces of Akhenaten's reign ended up having an ironic twist almost 3,000 years later. The result is now, of course, many thousands of years later, as uh, archaeologists work to uh, restore and study these monuments, what do they find? They find these thousands of temple blocks that Haram Heb thought he'd buried forever. And uh, since they've been buried all these years, uh, these scenes depicting Akhenaten and his cult are actually much better preserved than any of the scenes which depict Haram Heb. Horam Hemp also usurped many of the statues and monuments of his immediate predecessors. This was done by simply replacing their names with his. Two statues at Karnak are labeled with the name of Horam Heb, but most Egyptologists believe the facial features are similar to Tutankhamun's. While to us, this may seem to be the epitome of egotism, this practice was not uncommon for many of the pharaohs. Egyptians uh, might have not put such a negative spin on it, and they might have uh, considered it more of recycling, but it was also a royal prerogative in a way, because when a king took over, uh, he became divine, and therefore, since the office had always existed, then he in that office would always have been around and would always exist. It was a right and a privilege that the reigning monarch had. Horemheb ruled for almost 30 years, but when he died in 1306 BC, he, like Tutankhamun and I, was cursed by not having an heir. To avoid the chaos caused by a fight for succession, Horemheb nominated his trusted vizier for the job. This pharaoh took the name of Ramses. He would begin the 19th dynasty, one of the greatest periods of Egyptian history. Ramses had been a career army officer and was probably in his 50s when he became pharaoh. Ramses planned to continue rebuilding Egypt, but his reign lasted only two years. He did manage to accomplish something his three predecessors had not. Ramses produced a male heir to inherit the throne. Ramses' son was Seti I. He had been the vizier and troop commander during his father's brief reign. After inheriting the throne, Seti gave himself the additional title of repeater of births to signify the beginning of a new era. During his time as pharaoh, Egyptian art and culture flourished. Tremendous building projects were also undertaken. At Karnak, Seti enhanced the building of the great hypostyle hall here in the Temple of Amun. He also began to repair and augment the religious sites at Abydos. These efforts helped him to legitimize his non-royal bloodline's claim to the throne. Abydos was the ancient center dedicated to the cult of Osiris, the god of the dead. It was originally built in the Old Kingdom and had since fallen into disrepair. The temple Seti I built for himself at Abydos is considered one of the masterworks of the era. Inside, his likeness is depicted alongside many of the gods of Egypt, it is believed that the gods actually dwelled within the temples which were dedicated to them. The wall reliefs here are considered some of Egypt's finest, 
They were carved with great precision and in the more difficult raised technique instead of the more common and quicker inscribed carvings. Seti was also the pharaoh who had the list of kings inscribed in his temple at Abydos. It not only honored those who came before him, but also elevated Seti into their ranks. The name Seti means he of the god Seth. Seth was the deity of storms and war. Seti lived up to his name on the battlefield. He has grown up with the army. It's, it's a totally different attitude to life and certainly to royalty and the higher echelons. He fights incredible campaigns year after year against the Syrians. Amongst his great foundations was, in fact, the temple at Karnak. And on the north wall, you find these incredibly long and huge reliefs of Seti attacking fortresses, destroying the enemies of Egypt. He's a mighty warrior. In 1278 BC, Seti I died after reigning for an extremely productive 13 years. He was originally buried in a tomb prepared for him in the Valley of the Kings. But to protect Seti's remains from grave robbers, his mummy was later removed and taken to a hiding place, dug high into the cliffs above Queen Hatshepsut's temple at Dar el Bahari. Slightly over 100 years ago, in 1881, archaeologists unearthed this tomb. It revealed a remarkable collection of over 160 mummies known as the Royal Cache. Seti I was among the pharaohs discovered. His is the finest example of all the existing royal mummies. During his lifetime, Seti's primary queen was a woman named Tuya. Like her husband, she was from a non-royal family with a military background. Their first son died, their second child was a daughter, but their third child was a boy destined to become Egypt's most celebrated ruler. The dog star Sirius is the brightest in the Egyptian heavens. Each year, it disappears around the beginning of May to reappear about the 18th of July. To the ancient Egyptians, its return signaled the new year and the time for the annual Nile floods that would leave behind a new layer of fertile soil. One year during Seti's reign, the floods were particularly high. Egyptian legend told that this was the good omen that announced the coming of the next ruler of Egypt. This was Ramses II. Ramses II has become the name that is almost synonymous with Pharaoh. But it may have been Seti's careful preparation of his son, the crown prince, which really predestined Ramses' success. Ramses II was probably one of the best prepared pharaohs in Egypt because by the time that he came to the throne, they really uh, had a fairly regular process of making sure that all the senior royal princes uh, had a lot of experience in military affairs, in governance. So when they came to the throne, they were already uh, experienced and effective in what a pharaoh needed to be. By the age of 15, Ramses was already accompanying his father on military campaigns. By 22, he led his first command to put down a small revolt in Nubia. He also ambushed Mediterranean pirates who were searching for plunder along the mouth of the Nile. By the time Seti I's reign was coming to an end, his son had already proven himself as a military leader and worthy of kingship. Possessed with unmatched vision and self-confidence, the future king was poised to leave his indelible mark on the history of Egypt.